Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, come on, y'all got to get awake now. It's 11 o'clock. Only people that are allowed to be sleeping right now is me and the seniors, okay? Because we're young. Y'all are too. Amen. Good to see you guys this morning for Graduate Sunday. We're going to honor our graduates here in a little bit in, the, in a little bit in the service, but we want to welcome you to Oak Park Church. We believe uh, we believe that this is the greatest church in Mobile, in our community, and we believe in the world. Amen. How many loves your church? How many of you love your church? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But we want to welcome our first-time guests. You should, uh, in the bulletin, there's something to fill out, place an offering plate. And also in front of you, in the seat in front of you, there should be something to fill out. We just want to get to know you and make record of our visit. If you can, a few things. If you can share our, our Facebook live video right now and then check in maybe and just tell us and show us that you are present and you are here just to get us a little record of your visit please fill in that card fill out that card and place an offering plate as uh, as the offering comes later but amen at this time at oak park can we welcome our guests for the first time amen hallelujah all right this time i want you everybody to stand up with me and I want you to greet 97 new people to church this morning. Let's get ready for church. Welcome to graduation Sunday. I won't take more than 45 minutes, I promise. I promise. Just kidding. I've, I've got about four or five of y'all have already stood up spiritually and left out of this building. Today we've come to a part of our service to where we want to honor our graduates and we want to just honor them for their great accomplishments. We've had, and I'm not going to go into their GPAs because that's personal, but we had some people that graduated with more than a 4.5 GPA. Smart kid, smart kid. He's gonna be making me a lot of money one day. We had someone, we had some people that were just, thank you, Lottie, that was just ready to graduate, amen? You know, I say it every year, it's like summa cum laude, magma, magna cum laude. My brother graduated from college the other week with magna cum laude. I looked at my mom, I said, I just graduated, thank you, laude. I was just ready to get up out of that joint. Amen. But we want to honor our graduates. But graduates, before we honor you, I want to challenge you quickly. And this is, this is the hard, one of the hardest things to ever do as a youth pastor that Lindsay and I ever have to do. Especially this year because... The class of 2018, every kid is special to us in many ways. But the class of 2018 is our first four-year student that we've ever had. And uh, it's special to us because you guys hold a very special place in our heart. Whether you've been here four years, and I want you to know that. Whether you've been here four years or four minutes, you still mean a lot to me. 
and to Lindsay. It doesn't matter about how many times you've come to church. It matters that you're a part of this church and part of the kingdom of God. And that's all that matters. Amen. But the Bible says in Micah 6, 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the, the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6, 8. One of the hardest things as a student pastor, I believe, you have tough seasons, you have good seasons, you have hard seasons. But one of the hardest things to ever do as a youth pastor is to let you go. And Lindsay and I, as well as the leaders, we feel like we've invested everything that we can into you. And it would do you more harm for us to keep you. Some people think that you've got to stay in a certain place the rest of your life, y'all. That's, that's not how the kingdom of God works. One day you're, you're sipping on a bottle drinking milk and then one day you grow into the meat of the word and you got to grow up every now and then. Jesus, loved, he created a shout. He created a cry. He created all of that. But we'll make... We'll, but will, what make you a big difference in the world is you keeping the Word of God in your heart. And I'm telling you, the first thing that you need to do if you ever want to make an impact in the world is you need to learn to do right. Some people, parents, I'm not, I'm not knocking you down, but some parents have taught their kids just when they turn 21, it's okay to drink. And it's okay that they can go out and elope and they can do this and do that and they can smoke, they can buy this, they can do that, they can live together without being married. I'm just being honest with you guys. I don't believe that's right. Just because you can does not mean that you should. And I believe, I believe in you guys so much. Lindsay and I believe in you so much to teach you what the Bible says. Do right. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Secondly, y'all got to learn to forgive. Forgiveness is the key to life. If you hold a burden in your life about people that have hurt you and people that have let you down, you will be lonely and depressed all your life. If you will learn to forgive those that hurt you, then God in heaven will forgive you. That's what the Bible says. You've got to learn to forgive. Thirdly, you've got to walk humbly with your God. If I can say it over and over again, the, one of the most important things that I've sit down and talked to Pastor David about is filtering you guys into the church. That's the most important part. What are you going to do in the church? Oh, let's, let's come and sing a song and play games and hold hands and let, let's, do the, let's just sing Kumbaya. That's not what church is all about. We need young people in this church to learn to serve. And if you don't learn to serve, this church will die. I love seeing everybody serving. But it is time for you to replace them so they can do something else. We need more people to serve. And that's what a lot of people do is too many people want a title, but they don't they, they want a title, but they don't want to carry the towel around. They want to be called a pastor, but they don't want to come for serve day and set up chairs. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. That ain't gonna work in the kingdom of God. And it show ain't gonna work at Oak Park Church. If you want to make a difference in the world, well, I'm called to preach, but God hasn't opened a door for me to preach. Why don't you come and help us stack chairs and set up tables during the week? If you be faithful, I'm telling you, y'all, if you be faithful in the small things, God will make you ruler over many things. And you've got to get out of the mentality of your life. I'm not preaching to you guys. I'm preaching at myself, too. But I love you guys so much to tell you guys that we've got to get out of the, the entitlement issues of our mind. That's what our generation wants is entitlement. If you get away from that entitlement and you say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Pastor David, do you want me to come run a camera on a Sunday? Do you want me to, uh, do you want me to clean the carpet? Do you want me to buy you a steak dinner? Yeah, you can do that next Monday. You can do that for me anytime you want to. Ribeye. Ribeye. Remember, ribeye steak. Y'all, God wants you to learn to serve. Don't worry about a title. Worry about a towel. Amen. I'm proud of you guys. And I want you to know I love you guys. Lindsay and I love you with all of our heart. And we're going to miss you. But I know that if I kept you here, that you wouldn't soar like an eagle that God has called you to be. You're called to make a difference. 
So let's go ahead and start with the graduates. First up, and I want to, audience, I want you to hold your applause until I'm finished with each individual person. First person is Mr. Gavin Brown. Gavin Brown is the son of Eric and Katrina Brown. Gavin graduated from Baker High School. He will be studying mechanical engineering at the University of South Alabama, where he received the highest GPA scholarship to include studies abroad in Germany and co-op programs. <laughs> Brittany Marie Coley, daughter of Sal and Leslie Coley. Brittany graduated from Baker High School. She plans to attend the University of South Alabama, and she wants to get involved in missions and to help people in need. <laughs> Roland Dickens, son of Jody and Sherry Dickens. Roland graduated from Bryant High School. He's not sure what his final plans are yet. He's just going to see what God has in store for him. Cameron Elliott, son of Luther Elliott and Sarah Elliott. Cameron graduated from Bryant High School. He will be attending Mississippi Gulf Coast on a full ride for associate's degree, then transferring to South Alabama for a bachelor's degree in engineering. <laughs> Reese Ewing, son of Jerry and Jada Ewing. Reese graduated from Faith Academy and he had plans to attend Pearl River Community College where he received a baseball scholarship and a major in business. <laughs> Who I might add is a very, very good baseball player as well. We've got many of them, but just led Faith Academy to a championship this year. Miss Hannah Gartman. Hannah Gartman is the daughter of Deanna Myrick and Mike Gartman. Hannah graduated from Bryant High School and she plans to attend Charles Academy for Cosmetology. <laughs> Drew Grice. Drew Grice is the son of Anthony and Amber Grice. Drew graduated from Theodore High School and he plans to become a software designer. This is a story of God's faithfulness. What the devil tried to steal out of Anthony and Amber's life, look, their, their, their child is graduating. <laughs> Miss Ansley Hatchett. Ansley Hatchett is the daughter of Barry and Beth Hatchett. Ansley graduated from Bryant High School, and she plans to dance at Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. <laughs> Need I say that Ansley graduated from the top 10 of Bryant High School? Top 10. Come on and give her up another hand of applause. Her mama did really good on those papers for her. I'm just kidding. Samantha Henson. Samantha Henson is the granddaughter of Callie Kane. Samantha graduated from Bryant High School and she plans to attend Coastal Alabama and begin nursing school. Demarcus Hollis. Demarcus Hollis is the son of Melissa and Marcus Hollis. Demarcus graduated from Theodore High School and plans to obtain his, his adjuster license and work until January when he will start college at Coastal Community College to work in, on his degree as a dental hygienist. <laughs> Are you proud? Miss Farah Horn. Farah Horn is the daughter of Leah Horn and the late Lavi Horn, correct? Is that how you say his name, Lavi? There you go, she said, sure. Farah graduated from Bryan High School and she plans to further her education at Coastal Alabama Community College. There she will pursue her career of working as a social worker with child protection. Jackson Irby. Jackson Irby is the son of John and Catherine Irby. Jackson graduated from College Hill Christian Academy. He plans to attend the University of South Alabama to pursue a degree in chemical engineering. 
Weston Harris Kennedy, son of Wade and Renee Kennedy. Weston graduated from Theodore High School and plans to attend the University of South Alabama to major in computer science. Zachary Langham, son of Greg and Miss Darla Langham. Zachary graduated from Theodore High School and he plans to attend Bishop State and obtain an associate's degree as a physical therapy assistant. Mr. Aaron Moyers, son of Merle Moyers. Aaron graduated from the Lighthouse Baptist Academy and he plans to attend welding training at Austell. Gunner Nelson. Gunner Nelson is the son of Kenny and Brenda Nelson. Gunner is graduating from Bryant High School and he plans to attend the University of South Alabama on a music scholarship pursuing a music business degree. He will also be marching with the Jaguar Marching Band. Mr. Caleb Rogers. Caleb Rogers is the son of Eddie and Valerie Rogers. Caleb graduated from Bryant High School and he plans to attend the University of South Alabama on a $14,000 scholarship to pursue a degree in mechanical engineering. <laughs> Miss Haley Taylor. Haley Taylor is the daughter of Stephen and Darlene Taylor. Haley graduated from Theodore High School and she plans to attend Coastal Community College and pursue a degree in nursing. <laughs> Emily Rose Thames, daughter of Robin Thames. Emily graduated from Bryant High School and she plans to further her career in the medical field. Miss Ashton Trion. Ashton Trion is the daughter of David and Christina Trion. Ashton graduated from Bryant High School and plans to attend the University of South Alabama. <laughs> Mr. Dylan Langham. Dylan Langham is the son of Greg and Darla Langham. Dylan graduated from Mississippi Go. Mississippi Coast Community College. He received an associate's degree in instrumenta instrumentation and controls, and he plans to get a job. <laughs> that was the best. That's awesome. Brock Meter. Brock is the son of Danny and Sharon Michael. Brock graduated from Bishop State Community College with an Associates of Applied Science degree in Civil Engineering Technology. He plans to pursue a career in the structural or civil engineering field to become a structural designer working from an engineering firm or company. <laughs> Mr. Brandon Morgan. Brandon Morgan is the husband of Jenny Morgan. He graduated from the University of South Alabama with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration with a concentration in General Management. He plans to continue working at OPC and not get fired. <laughs> I added that last part. It does say he plans to continue working at OPC. That's his future plans. Lastly, our last college degree is Miss Lindsay Spicer. Ms. Lindsay, is, she is the daughter of Annette Horton and William Spicer. She graduated from the University of South Alabama with a degree in Geography and Sociology. She plans to teach high school and to continue to partner with Future World Missions and work in Malawi. How do you say that? Mal Malawi? How do you say that? Malawi. Okay. I'm from Tennessee. I can't say that big word. We had, we had somewhere around 35 graduates total this year. 27, 27 made their way up here, 26, 27, something like that. Can we give the class of 2018 a big round of applause? Just remain on your feet. 
Can you guys remain here for just a moment? Pastor Stewart has, has uh, very eloquently shared from his heart this morning, and I just want to tell, <laughs> very eloquently shared from that iPad, that's what we all do. You think through, don't you, and write it down. Yeah. I started to say, I started to say he's like Trump, as long as he stays on that iPad, but every now and then. But I love our president, by the way, don't y'all get mad at me. We want to pray for these students. We want to ask God's blessing upon them and all that they do. I'm preaching this morning. I hope you guys will hang around because I'm preaching about dreams and imagining for the future because I've got you in mind. So I'll talk about some things later that I really will speak into your life. But right now, I just want to pray for them. Would you just stretch your hand this way and let's just ask God's protection and direction for their life. And let's just, it's our responsibility today to pray for them. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you today for the privilege that we have, Lord for these students to be a part of this church family. We thank you, Lord, for the time that they've already been here. We thank you for the future that we believe will be bright. And Lord, I pray that you'll guide each of their steps, protect them, watch over them from any harm or distraction that would come their way. Guard their hearts, guard their bodies, and guard their minds. Protect them from anything that would come to steal, kill, and destroy. And God, place your hand upon them. Let your anointing and your purpose be premiere in their life and God will be careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor knowing that your best for them is yet to come and we ask all these things in Jesus name and the church said amen could you give them one more big hand clap of appreciation thank you guys
Jesus hell trembles demons flee he has no rival he has no equal there's none that compares to him he's a great God amen before you're seated this morning shake hands with two or three people once again and say I'm so glad you're in church with me today amen thank you for being here this morning you may be seated so good to see you in the house of the Lord thank you for being here this morning to worship with us from wherever you came today, we want to honor you and thank you for making the choice to be here. We've already had one service here this morning, and uh, God just spoke to us, I believe, and touched us, and I'm so thankful for what he's already done today, but I believe the, that there's more to come, and I know that God is going to speak to you and touch you. I know that we have many people that are guests this morning. You're visiting with your uh, student, some of you, and we're just so honored that you're here this morning. If you would take just a moment today and look in front of your seat there's a card there we call that a prayer card because that's what we do with those cards we pray over them and uh, agree with you for every need that you have and your prayer request we would love for you to fill that out especially if you're a first-time guest and just let us know you're here we're not gonna bother you we're not gonna spam you we just want to say thank you for being here and then we have a special gift for you as you leave today if you'll just drop that off at guest central that's that counter as you leave um, and just pick up a little bag that has some things in it. It's just our way of saying thank you. Just a few little tokens uh, so that you'll remember Oak Park. And hopefully you'll come back and be a part of worship here at Oak Park. This is a great church and we're here because it's a great church because God is in this place. And because there's great people that make up the church. So we're very thankful for you. Each week, before I do this, I was going to say a couple of things. First of all, today is Pastor Ricky's. I'm going to say it. It is his 60th. You ought to be proud to be 60. He's the youngest 60 I know. 60th birthday. So we're thankful for him. And uh, we got other birthdays, I know, all throughout the church today. I was told this morning. So happy birthday to each of you. So this morning, we want to give you an opportunity to give to the Lord. Last week, I read one verse of Scripture out of Philippians. Amen. That's all right. We're excited to give. Last week we read, I read one verse of scripture and I said I wanted to walk through that verse for a couple of weeks. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Last week I talked about that first word, but. It's a transitional word. It takes you from one place to another place. And that's what God will do. God will take you when you don't know how you're going to pay that bill. You don't know how you're going to accomplish that task. And I've always said, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. He'll make a way where there seems to be no way. And so that but's a powerful word. We talked about that last week. But there's two words there that I saw this morning that I wanted to mention to you today as we give unto the Lord. And it's just simply this. It says, but my God. <laughs> I don't know about your God. I don't know about everybody else's God. I don't, I don't know a lot about Allah. I don't know much about Krishna or, or Buddha. I don't know a lot about that. But after 30 years of serving the Lord, I can tell you something. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. I have seen him do it over and over and over and over again. And so this week, I shared this morning, and I don't want to say a lot about it, but I flip on the news. And, you know, I understand the media is always going after, especially churches and, and ministers. And it's always going to be negative, and they're going to take it to another level. But I was reading some stuff and watching some stuff this week about a ministry that had asked for $54 million for a jet. I promise you, we're not asking for 54 million. I'm asking for 54 million. That would be sweet because there's a lot we could do with it, but it would not be to buy a jet. I promise you. Although when I look at my calendar, I'm thinking maybe I could ride on his. I don't know. I'm just joking. But Oak Park Church is a place that loves God and loves people. 
when you give this morning, your tithe reaches out to 140 nations of the world to preach the gospel. Through the network we're a part of, every dollar you give, 10% of that goes out to support the ministry outside, beyond what we give as a local church. But just from that tithe, 10 cents out of every dollar goes to support missionaries in 184 nations of the world. When you give, it supports the outreach ministry that we have every single week, almost every single night. Somebody is in a rehab center or a ministry that is ministering to people who have come off drugs and we're ministering to them. When you give, a portion of that goes to feed the hungry every single month. Sister Anna leads and directs that food bank ministry on top of ministry, on top of ministry, on top of ministry that is ministering to our community every single day. And we attempt to be good stewards, and I believe with all of my heart that we are. And I'll stand before God accountable for that along with this board of this church. But I just want to tell you, you have a father, my God. Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 11, the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, when you pray, pray like this. And he starts off the prayer by saying, our father. That sounds like my God. Our father. And when I think about that, I realize he's my God, he's my Abba Father, that I don't have to be in lack. I don't have to, because my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And then another verse says he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. And what that means is not only will he meet my needs, but he'll, he'll bless me above my needs so that I can meet, do the things that he has called me to do. Our church, thank God we're able to pay the power bill and the water bill and the salaries and those things. But thank God that he blesses you to be a blessing so we can go above our needs and we can go out of these four walls and we can minister to widows and minister to orphans and minister to those that are in need. And we do it, as I said, on a daily basis. I have three children. They're all grown. They don't live at home, but they still have needs. This week, I shared in the first service, my youngest daughter lives in North Carolina. My son-in-law is in the U.S. Army. And he, she was by herself, baby was in the back seat. She had gone to the commissary to get groceries and she called me, she said, Dad, my car is locked up and I'm panicking. I'm thinking, man, we gave her that car a few years ago and I'm thinking, it cannot be. I'm like, what did you do, let it run dry on oil? I mean, how in the world is it locked up? And I said, what's it doing? She said, I said, is it knocking? What's happening? She said, no, it, the key won't turn, it's locked up. And I said, okay. So she's FaceTiming me and so she starts explaining the situation. I said, okay, here's what you need to do. Take your steering wheel and turn it all the way to the left and hold it there and then turn the key. And she said, it won't work. Dad, it's not working. So I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to figure it all out. But I'm telling you, I was about to hop in my car. That baby, she said, the baby's hot. Well, it's going to take me 10 hours to get there, but baby, I'm about to get to North Carolina, take care of that baby and my daughter. I'm figuring out a way how, you know why? Because I'm their daddy. I'm their father. And whatever I've got to do, if I've got to call a tow truck, if I've got to call a mechanic, if I've got to call somebody to get up there and take care of her, I'm going to take care of her because that's my child. Isn't it amazing that what she did is turn that steering wheel later and turn the key and it was all good. It was a little of nothing. Sometimes we make a big deal out of small things. But God's up in heaven looking at his children and say, saying, I love you enough that I'll come down from heaven and I'll send my son to take care of your problem. And it was a big problem, a sin problem. So my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. So when you give today in your tithes and your offerings, you're, you're supplying the needs that and the ministry that this church does on a daily basis, but you're also walking in covenant with God and God says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. He's our daddy, he's our God, he's our father and he will take care of you. Father, I thank you this morning for the privilege that we have to bring our tithes and offerings to the storehouse. Thank you for the privilege that we have from Oak Park Church to minister to this county, to minister to this community and this region. Lord, we couldn't do it without the faithfulness of your people. And I'm just thankful today, Lord, that you have blessed us to be a blessing. Lord, as we, as we attempt to be good stewards with what you assign to us, I pray, Lord, that you'll bless the giver and the gift and that you'll cause it to go even beyond what it appears to be. For your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give. Sinner 
chains of the past are broken at last. I got saved. Oh, I got saved. He picked me up. He picked me up. Turn me around. Can you just stand to your feet and thank God that he picked you up? Turn me around. Place my feet on solid ground. Pick me up. Turn me around. Place my feet on solid ground. Pick me up. Turn me around. Place my feet on Yes, he did. Pick me 
restored and made you right. you're restored and made right Jesus got a hold of your life and there's reason to rejoice amen praise God he's a mighty God come on one more time just give Jesus a big clap of praise let him know you love him this morning amen and you may be seated this morning praise God now for those of you who like to get out at 12 o'clock that gives me eight minutes so I, I've got faith with you, I believe, but I don't believe. I have faith, but my faith is weak. But I am going to do my best not to keep you here all day. The good news is for our graduates, y'all have lunch here, so you don't have to go far. You don't have to wait in line. So, I mean, you figure that in. You figure the drive time getting there. I've got at least, what, 45 to an hour at least. And I'm going to try not to take all that this morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me, please, to the book of Acts 26, verse 19. And I do want to preach a word, I want to share a word this morning that the Lord gave me this week, directed me to this week that I believe is very applicable. I'm, I, I preach this in the early service and it always comes out differently every time you speak. You know, I can have the same outline, but it always comes out a little different. But I, I spoke it this morning, but the Lord really gave it to me for this service because I knew that we would have some of our graduates that would be in here this morning. And I really believe it's a word that uh, first of all, God has been speaking to me personally over the last few days, and that's how I like to preach. I like to preach out of the overflow of what God is speaking to me. Secondly, I believe it's for these young folks that are in, us, in the room with us this morning. And it's so in my spirit that I'm not just going to preach it this morning. I'm going to start a series, and I'm going to preach throughout the month of June over the next three weeks at least. I want to title this, this series of messages, Imagine. If you look behind me, you probably wonder, what in the world is that canvas, that frame and canvas doing back here. There's nothing on it. It's white. It's, it's just plain. Because over the next few weeks, I want you, no matter of your victories, your successes, your failures, your disappointments, I want us to, to come before the Lord beginning today. And I want us to say to God, Lord, I'm forgetting the things which are behind me and pressing to the things which are ahead. Especially to these students who are here, you're flipping the page, going to a new chapter. And I want you to, if, as you look, I'm a very visual person. I have to see something. And as I was driving down the road thinking about this sermon yesterday, I had this frame in my office, and I just popped the picture that was in it out and put this plain canvas because I wanted you to see what I want to talk about over the next three weeks. This is your life beginning today. It's a clean slate. Some of you may have walked in here today, and, and you've, you've got a lot of baggage you got a lot of stuff you've been carrying with you. you got some pain. Maybe some of you have got some hurts and disappointments that you brought with you. But the good news is that God can take it and he can wipe it all clean, and it's a clean slate. Some of you, you've got so many victories and successes, and God has done so many wonderful things in your life. But if you're not careful, you'll keep living in that and miss your tomorrow. I'm going to say that again. You'll keep living in your memories and miss the future that God has for you tomorrow. So I want this to be a picture over the next three weeks. And in your mind, before this three weeks is over, I want you to paint your own portrait on that frame, on that canvas. 
And I want you to imagine what God is going to do in your life, in your ministry, in your marriage, in your family, whatever area you're trusting and believing God for. Begin to believe with me. Can you imagine with me, anybody in this room that can just lift your hand and say, Pastor, I'll imagine with you. I'll dream with you. I'll do that. Whether it's for your, this church or it's for you individually, let's begin to dream. Amen. There's a scripture that's found in Acts chapter 26 and verse 19. And while I'm going to read several scriptures, I wanted to use this one as my text today. Very short, one verse of scripture. Paul is standing before King Agrippa. You've heard that story. You remember that it was King Agrippa who was a wicked king. Paul is standing there. He's giving a defense for his ministry, for the gospel that he's been preaching. His life is at stake, literally. He is standing before the judge that could uh, give the king, who could give him the death sentence. And he says these words, Paul, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Some of you that are in this room that are students that we just honored a moment ago, you're young. Oh, you're so young. You've got so much in front of you. Even the college graduates, I looked as they were standing there, and I thought, man, the potential, the, 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 the future that's standing on this stage. Amen. I, I, I leaned over to a couple of them, and I said, if you, if, when you graduate, not if, but when you graduate and you do that, I told Drew, when you design that software, keep paying ties, son. Keep paying ties. Amen. And because God has future for all of them. He has great plans, but he also has it for you. But when I get to the end of this journey, I don't want to have to look back. You know, I talk about the ice chip people. When they're gathered around my bed, and I know that my time on life is over, and the moments are slipping into eternity, I want to be able to say what Paul said. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I want to be able to say that I did what God told me to do, that I was faithful to the vision that he put in my heart. And so I want to tell you, dream on this morning. And as we go to the Word for a few moments, that's the thesis. That's the thought of what I want to share with you today. Would you just ask God's blessing upon the next few moments as I share my heart with you? Father, I thank you today for the privilege that I have to preach at this place in this moment to these people. God, I, I know I need you today. I can't preach. I can't do anything without you. But I know that today, Lord, you can speak through me, and somehow you can use the words that come out of this mouth of clay to speak what you would have to say to this people. And I ask it and ask your anointing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Acts 26 and verse 19, Paul says, our text, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Paul, a man to the man who was about to take his life, says, I had a vision, and I can look back over my life, and I can say, from the day that God found me on that road to Damascus, I was on my way to persecute Christians. And since that day that a great light shone, shined upon me and knocked me to the ground, and I went to Ananias' house, and he laid hands on me, and God placed the Holy Spirit inside of me, I can say, Agrippa, that from that day I have not been disobedient unto that heavenly vision. Helen Keller is famous for making a statement that the thing worse than being blind would be to have natural sight and to have no vision. But yet that's the condition of a lot of people. We live through life with no vision, just going day by day, moment by moment, step by step. And the world is filled with people who do not have a dream. But you need a dream. Everybody in this room, from the youngest to the oldest, needs a dream. You say, well, Pastor, I'm 80, 85 years old. I, I can't, you know, there's no use in me dreaming. Tell that to Caleb. Caleb had went into the promised land, and they had conquered all the territory. He's now 85 years old. And he goes and he stands with where, where Joshua and all the people of Israel were at, and they're dispersing all of the land. And here's Caleb, the senior statesman of the bunch, and they're dispersing all of the different property, and everybody is wanting, you know, they're lobbying and uh, politicking for the right piece of property. And here steps up Caleb, and everybody's like, man, I wanted that lakeside property, and here's Caleb. You know he's going to get that. But what does Caleb do at 85 years old? Caleb steps up, and he says, give me that mountain. That's what the Bible says. He was specific. He didn't say, give me a mountain. He said, give me 
that mountain. What mountain? The same mountain that 40 years earlier God gave him a vision to conquer the giants and to possess that mountain had not yet been taken. That mountain still had giants on it. And here's an 85-year-old man who had given his life pursuing God's purpose. And he said, I'm not ready to get into a rocking chair and I'm not willing to acquiesce into retirement, but give me that mountain that has those giants on it that God told me 40 years ago that I would conquer. I'm telling you, as long as there is breath in your lungs, there is a hope for your future. Can somebody help me today? Amen. There is a purpose for your life. You need a dream that's beyond your reach, that's beyond your natural reach, beyond your natural abilities, beyond your natural talents. You need a dream that's bigger than your bank account, bigger than anything in the natural because we live in a world that is daily progressing because somebody had a dream. It's true. Alex, the Wright brothers dreamed, and because of that, we have aviation. Alexander Graham Bell dreamed a dream, and because of that, we have communication. And even today, like with my grandson who lives in North Carolina, every day I can pick up my cell phone, I can FaceTime, and I can watch him, I can watch, see his first tooth. I can see him crawl. I can communicate like I'm there and hear him speak his first words because Alexander Graham Bell had a dream before you could ever pick up a phone and dial a, a rotary phone. He had a dream that we could do what we're doing now. Aren't you glad somebody dreamed a dream? Amen. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed a dream, and today we have civil rights. This past week, I was extended an invitation uh, to go to an event in August that I accepted to do the prayer and the invocation at an event on the top of Stone Mountain where there are about, uh, there will be over 500 churches that will gather over 100,000 people that will gather at the foot of Stone Mountain, and it will be every race. It's called the One Race Movement, where they're bringing together uh, people of all, every nationality, every tribe, every denomination that you can imagine, and they're coming together on that day. Why Stone Mountain? Because it was Martin Luther King Jr. in his speech about a dream that said, I dream of the day when the sons of slaves and the sons of slave owners will sit together at the table of brotherhood, and from the top of Stone Mountain, it shall ring forth. Let freedom ring. And amen. And in 19, listen, in 1915, this is all fresh because I just met these guys this week. But in 1915, the Ku Klux Klan reorganized at the top of Stone Mountain and they burned the cross. It was the first cross under this new reorganized Ku Klux Klan that burned at the top of Stone Mountain in Atlanta and initiated what really prompted the civil rights movement to happen in the 60s, but it began back in 1915. But in August, on the 55th anniversary of the speech about a man who had a dream, all of that's going to be put in reverse when hundreds of thousands of people, the sons of slaves and the sons of slave owners, will stand and unwind everything that was done almost 100 years ago. Come on, somebody ought to praise God. It all happens, it all happens because one man dreamed. And I get to be a part of that. That's incredible. I can't believe. I don't know how I ended up in that conversation, but it's amazing to me. Something happens when people dream. All throughout history, God has given people dreams. Jacob had a dream, and he said, I have found the gate of heaven. Joseph dreamed a dream that unlocked his future, unlocked his destiny. And any time that God gets ready to bless a generation, it always begins on the inside with a dream. I, I once heard someone say that there's five stages to a dream. I've actually shared this with you before, but I want to share it again real quickly this morning. The first phase is the I thought it stage. That's where a dream begins. It's just something that drops into your mind. You just begin thinking about it. It starts with an idea. It starts with something that just hits you, and, and you begin to meditate upon it. You just begin to imagine, what would it be like if I could do that? What would, what would happen if that actually took place? It's one thing to get the thought, but then the next step is the I called it stage. It's more than just a thought that passes through your mind, but then you catch that thought and you begin to meditate upon it. Now you're not just thinking about it, you're excited about it. I mean, all of a sudden, it's not just a thought, but you're actually beginning to implement it. You got the graph paper down and the calculator out, and you're, you're trying to figure out how can this come to pass? What's the steps A, B, C, D to make this happen? But too many people stop there and they never go on to the next place, which is the I bought it stage. And that's the place where all of a sudden you're investing in this thing. Now all of a sudden you've went online and you're filling out your FAFSA. 
Some of y'all know what that is. And you're filling out your applications. And you're filling out all the things that are going to take you to that next place. It's where you move beyond just a thought and a talk, but you actually begin to take the risk. You get the education that you need. You step out on a limb. You're working two jobs, and you're tired, and you're stretched. And then you get real crazy, and you move on to the next step, and that's the I saw it stage. That's, that's where the desire gets so strong that you can't even think about anything else. It's all that's on your mind. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's just like consuming you, and your kin folks can't talk you out of it. Your kids, your mom, your dad, they can't talk you out of it. It's in your eyes. You've got the eye of the tiger. I'm focused. This is what God said. This is what I'm going to accomplish it, accomplish in my life. So there's the I thought it, the I caught it, the I bought it, and then that moves you to the next stage, which is the I got it stage. And isn't it something when you walk into that place where all of a sudden the thing you dreamed about you now possess? Isn't it awesome? The Bible says for the joy, the, see there's power in vision. The Bible says without a vision the people perish. The scripture also says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, the vision that was placed ahead of him, he endured the cross. That's what nailed him, to, that's what kept him on that cross was the vision of what would be on the other side of that cross. I told the early service this morning, let me, and I, I hesitate to tell it again, but I'm going to tell it because I need to connect with you about the power of vision. I was raised, my dad died when I was 13 years old, so I was raised in a single parent home. I had to go to work when I was 13, not to buy the latest uh, game, video game, but to provide electricity for our house. I had to pay the power bill. So when I was 13, 14 years old, I'm working. Every, on, during the summer, I'm working 60 hours a week in a potato shed. That's what you do when you grow up on Sand Mountain. And I'm working every day. It's back before, I guess, there, there were probably labor laws back then, but they didn't, you, they didn't care about them because I was working 60, 70 hours a week, hard work in those potato sheds. So I, I grew up that way. I, I grew up all through school. I was, a, I was a good student, believe it or not. And I grew up all the way through school making good grades, but I went to a, a, a private school. I went back to a public school, and because of that, some things didn't transfer over. So six weeks away from graduation, although I had... I'd, never, I'd always made good grades, but I get to the end of the, seat, the year, and all of a sudden, I'm told I can't graduate because I had some credits that didn't transfer from the other school. So I was discouraged, and I was going to have to go to summer school, and I couldn't go to summer school so, uh, because I had to work. I had to provide for my mother and my brother and my sister. So I went to work, and I never finished high school. I never finished. I was one half credit short graduating from high school. So I just lived life. I got a job, and at that time, you could do things a little differently than you can now. And so I just went to work, and I started working a job, and, and God gave me favor and the jobs that I worked, and I would be promoted. And by the time I'm in my mid-20s, I've, I've gotten pretty good jobs. And, and then God calls me into ministry, and I go to pastor a church, and I had been pastoring the church for about a year. And I pastored that first church, and in the back of my mind, nobody ever asked me, and I never told them I didn't have a high school diploma. But I didn't. I had the education, I'd done the work, but I didn't have a high school diploma. And I just always kind of justified it. But all of a sudden one day, I thought it, I caught it, and I bought it. That I couldn't stay where I was at. That I, I couldn't preach the things I'm preaching to you today if I stayed in that place. And so I remember having to go sign up to get my GED so I could go back to school. And I remember the, 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 the feeling that I had when I go and I'm embarrassed because I'm pastoring in this town and I go to this junior college that's in the town where I pastor and I didn't want anybody to know, especially back then, now it's my testimony. Then it was an embarrassment to me. And I had to bite my pride and I had to go down and I had to say, I need to take my GED. In order to do that in Georgia in those days, I had to go through some classes. And I, I went through the classes and I remember every Thursday night going and sitting in that classroom. And in that classroom, I was surrounded by people who were high school dropouts that were 16, 17, 18 years old who the courts had mandated to go take those classes. So I'm in that room with all of these people who are being mandated by a judge to go take the class, and I'm a pastor. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is embarrassing. I'm humiliated. I can't do this. And all of a sudden, the Lord said, I may have put you here for a purpose. And I started loving the kids that were in that class with me and realized it wasn't as much about me getting a GED as it was ministering and loving on them. And many of them ended up in our church. I got my GED. I went back to school. I got 
all of the education. I'm going back in the fall. I'm still dreaming to finish up a master's degree. See, God will take you from where you are. If you'll dream, he'll help you accomplish that goal and that task. But you've got to dream it. Now, why would I tell you all that? Because I stand here now, and it's easy to give you the big picture and to say, I went to Lee University, but I didn't tell you I was a high school dropout that I had to provide for my family. But there was something inside of me that stirred and said, I have got to dream. Now, for you, that may not be what God's called you to do. It may not be that at all. But whatever it is that God is stirring you to do, I, I mean, you've got to understand that you're getting older every day. I'm getting older every day. But my worst nightmare, I'm telling you, I have come to this place where I refuse to live in the nightmare called regret. I refuse to find myself one of these days sitting on the front porch in a rocking chair saying, what if... When I get done with this journey, I do not want to say, what if I had of? What if I'd have done that? I want to be what Paul says. I do not want to be disobedient to the heavenly vision. And whatever God has called you to do, don't back up from it. Move forward into the calling of God on your life. Paul. The Bible tells us in Acts 26, he said to King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And what he's saying is, despite the hardships of life, and there will come some, come on somebody, there will come some hardships. But Paul said, despite the hardships, despite the things that come against me, I was not disobedient unto the, unto the vision that was given to me. The vision that Paul had, that he God gave him, did five things for his life. I'm going to try to walk through this as quickly as I can. I realize what time it is. When you get a hold of a heavenly vision for your life, it will absolutely do some things to your life. The first thing it did to the Apostle Paul was it stopped him. He was on his way with his own agenda, doing his own thing. He was a persecutor of Christians. He's on his way to kill more Christians. And all of a sudden, in that moment, the vision stopped him. Will you say that with me? It stopped him. You know the story. In the middle of the, in the, middle of the day, he had a sunstroke, an S-O-N stroke. Suddenly, he was stopped. Can I tell you that when God finds you, he will stop you right where you are. He will change your direction. He will change everything that you think in your mind. You have purpose. The Bible says that a man prepares his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. You can plan to do one thing, and God says, no, I've got another plan for your life. But when we walk in that plan and that purpose that God has for our life, it is incredible what he will do. I told some stories that I don't have time to tell in this service. I told in the early service. I, I hope somebody will go back and watch some of that because I have watched God my entire adult life take dreams and make them reality. It has been absolutely an amazing journey. And I told Kim, we were talking last night, I said, I don't ever want to get to the place where I'm more concerned about my rearview mirror than I am a windshield. I don't want to get so focused on where I've been and what I've done and the things God has done at this place in life that I stop looking forward to the vision that God has for us. Because I believe for everyone in this room, the reason you're alive today is because the best is yet to come in your life. Say amen, somebody. I've got to tell this, and I, I'm not saying this for any other reason but to, for you to understand that God will give you dreams and vision that is bigger than you, so much bigger than you. I remember that standing. We had just our first church. I, I told the story of that whole journey, but our first church, we'd, we'd grown, we'd built a new building, we'd ro relocated, and I'm in prayer one day, and the Lord gives me a clear statement. He says, I want you to, I, I hear the Spirit of the Lord telling me, I want you to say to the church, this is our mission, this is our vision, it is to, impact, it is to reach this city, impact the world. We had that on billboards all over the city. Uh, we had it on there, Trenton Church, I started to say Oak Park Church, Trenton Ministry Center, reaching our city, impacting the world. And I'm sitting there thinking, now let me paint this picture for you, okay? I'm, I'm in a town, I'm pastoring a church at that time where there's about 150, 200 people. We're in a town that if you counted everybody, there were 1,120 people. If I say Trenton, Georgia, nobody in this room hardly knows where that's at. It's a little spot. As a matter of fact, it's disconnected from the rest of Georgia. In order to get from Trenton, Georgia, to the rest of Georgia, you've either got to go to Tennessee or Alabama to get over there. Georgia doesn't even know where it's at. When they printed the coin with the state on it, 
Dade County, which is Trenton, Georgia, was cut off the map. Yeah, that made some folks mad. So I'm here, and the Lord says, I want you to reach the city and impact the world. I said, well, God, I believe I can reach this city. 1,000 of them, we can do that. But impact the world? How in the world from Trenton, Georgia, am I going to impact the world? But I said, Lord, I believe you. If you're telling me we're going to impact the world, but then I would, I remember preaching that that Sunday morning, and I had people looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. I said, we're going to reach our city and impact the world. They looked at me just like you're looking at me right now. And I went home that day, and I was discouraged. I said, Lord, you told me that somehow we're going to reach this city and impact the world, but I can't do it by myself, and they didn't seem to be too excited about it. And the Lord, I heard, I had a piece that said, you just hear what I'm telling you. And I said, God, I believe you, but I don't know how. Can I tell you, and I can't go to all the story of how it all worked out, but can I tell you that God took this little country, Sand Mountain boy, pastoring a little church in Trenton, Georgia, and within 60 days arranged it so I was standing, within 60 days of God telling me that, I was standing in the chapel service of the United Nations in New York City, preaching to over 100 ambassadors from all over the world. I got a call. God said, I want you to impact the world. How am I going to impact the world where there's no greater place to speak to the world than the United Nations? But how do you get a boy from Podunk, Georgia, to the United Nations? You have a relationship with one person who knows somebody who gave me a call and says, hey, I got invited to T.L. Lowry. I got invited to the United Nations, and I want you to go with me. Can you go? I didn't ask Kim. I didn't ask God. I said, absolutely. I'm packing right now. When are we leaving? And I got to go to the United Nations, stand in the chapel at 777. <laughs> oh, go figure that out. I got the picture in my office. The address was seven. The address of the chapel at the United Nations is 777 United Nations Way. And I walk in there, and behind me, there I've got the picture somewhere in my office. There's the picture of, there's the, of the emblem of Islam. There's the emblem of Buddhism. There's all these different religious symbols behind me. And I was able to stand there with my Bible open and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in that place. <laughs> Only God can do that. Only God can do that. But God said, if you'll drink, now let me tell you what happened. The very next week, I get a call from our state senator, and he says, Pastor Smith, he said, would you come to Atlanta, to the state capital of Georgia, and would you lead our Senate in prayer and in a devotion? So I said, absolutely. So the next week, Kim and I and a delegation from our church goes to the state capitol, and I stand before the state senate and open that senate up in prayer and watch as senators got down on their knees. Some were lifting their hands and preached the gospel. I'm telling you, I don't know if I'll ever get an opportunity to do all that again, and I think it was all just for me, for God to say, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. But I come to tell you, if God said it, he will make it happen happen it doesn't matter what your pedigree is where you come from who you are he'll make a way where there seems to be no way I didn't get to either one of those places because I asked or because I was qualified. I had those two opportunities because God, just like he saw David on the backside of a pasture shoveling sheep dung, he saw me being faithful in a little church and a little place and said, I'll help you talk to the world if you'll trust me. How do I get to open up a prayer at Stone Mountain? Because I hosted the TV program Thursday, and two guys in charge just happened to come to that program. And I just happened to be hosting, and I just happened to meet them, and I just happened to get the chance to pray the prayer to open up one of the most significant racial reconciliation meetings that's ever took place in that city of Atlanta, and I don't even live there anymore. Only God can do those things. Only God can do those things. It stopped him, and then it sent him. He was sent to the Gentiles. Now watch this. Paul had a burden for the Jews. We read that. But God said, I'm going to send you to a place that you don't even have a burden. See, some of you are saying, this is what I feel like I ought to do. But God said, I want you to do what I want you to do. And sometimes you're wondering why God's telling you to go to left when you want to go right. Because God's plans, I'm preaching to somebody today. Because you're wondering, how in, how in the world did you get here? 
Because God is ordering the steps of a good man and a good woman. And you don't know why God's sending you left when you wanted to go right. But if you'll trust the GPS of the Holy Spirit, he's taken you to a place where he can do something in you and through you that is significant. Let me hasten to a close. It strengthened him. Paul said, I have attained help from him. See, sometimes you just have to trust God. The Apostle Paul, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25, he tells us that he was striped on his back five times. He was shipwrecked three times. He was beaten with rods three times. He was stoned one time. And Paul said, but Paul said after saying all that, he said, that's just the small print of my life. Because he writes to us in Romans 8 and verse 18, and he says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that awaits me. And then he says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he takes all this stuff, I mean, being beaten on his back, being beaten on his feet, striped on his back, put in prison, stoned, shipwrecked. And listen to what he says. For this light affliction makes that headache seem, that little, that little passing headache seem a little less. Makes that, makes that person didn't shake your hand seem a little less important, doesn't it? And Paul says, for this light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. This is the Apostle Paul. He said... <laughs> He said, I've been striped, I've been beaten. I was not disobedient. In the midst of all that trouble, and trouble will come, I have not been disobedient to the faith and faithful to the call that you placed on my life. Listen, the reality is, if you're ever going to achieve anything significant in life, can I just say something right here and make you a little upset before we leave? Y'all heard one come on and 300 absolutely nots by your silence. But I'm going to say it anyway. I'll just try and be courteous. <laughs> Stop whining. If we're ever going to accomplish something significant, stop whining. If anybody's got a reason to cry, if I had time, I told you some good stories. If I had time to tell you some struggles along the way, I'd tell you this morning. There's been times where I wanted to just crawl up and cry. Is that all right for me to be honest with you and tell you? There's times I wanted to hide out. I didn't want to come out of my room. I didn't want to come out of my house. I just wanted to cry myself to sleep. I've been there. But I'm telling you, if you're going to ever do anything significant for God, you've got to stop whining. You have got to pull yourself up. I posted it this week. Some of you have seen my social media post. I remember when I first started pastoring, I owned one suit. I had one black suit. I had three ties. I had one pair of dress shoes, and it had holes in them. But I would get some shoe polish, and I would polish my shoes. I would stick cardboard in the bottom of them. I would change the tie so people didn't know I was wearing the same suit. I would hold my chin up. I didn't have gas money to go to the hospitals, but I'd pick up the phone, and I'd call, and some people would get upset because I called them. I didn't come visit them, but I wouldn't dare tell them why I didn't come visit them was because I I didn't have the gas to put in the car to get there. Now, I don't live in those days anymore. God has blessed me, and I'm thankful for that journey. I'm thankful for where God has brought me from, but I'm telling you, it's time. You can't whine about it. you got to get up and do the best you can do with what you have and dream big. Dream that there will come a day when you won't have to do it like that anymore. Amen? And then the vision stretched him. I'm finishing if the musicians will come. It stretched him. The vision helped him become what he never would have been become without it. The journey is more important than the destination. I love sports. I'm a big sports fan. And I, when I look at the Olympics or whatever, I remember several years ago, and I'm a huge Alabama fan, y'all know that, but I lived in Georgia and for five, well, I lived in Georgia total for 23 years, but when I lived in the Atlanta area, I lived about, about 10 miles from UGA. And no offense to Georgia fans, but I just couldn't stand Georgia. I love Georgia fans, but I couldn't stand Georgia. And, but I like Bubba Watson. And then I found out he played for Georgia, and I'm like, good grief. But I, I like Bubba Watson. And I remember when he won the Masters a few years ago. Remember, he was on, and I was just, I was watching everything he was on. And he was on Piers Morgan doing an interview. And he asked him some question, and, and Bubba Watson just started crying. And if you remember that, when he won the Masters, he got the trophy, he just started bawling. He started crying. And I thought to myself, he wasn't crying. That day when they handed him that master's, or not the trophy, but the jacket, 
They put that jacket on, he just started crying. Like, he's not crying for that moment. He's crying about the journey that got him there. He's remembering being a little boy. He never took golf lessons, but his dad helped teach him how to play golf. And his dad out there in the yard teaching him how to pitch. And he's remembering those moments. And as he's holding that, he's remembering being a little boy dreaming about a day when he would do what he just done. And isn't that what praise is really about? Praise is not about what all I'm standing in, but praise is about the journey that's taken me there. I may not be where I'm going to be, but I'm on my way. And I can praise God for the journey. I can praise God. Some of you students, you're not there yet. You've got big dreams. You've got big goals. You, some of you are probably standing in a place right now thinking, I don't even know what I'm going to do. I heard, the, I heard it read. I was at the same place. My kids have been there before. Oh, you're, not, you're not unusual. I don't know what I want to do with life yet. I really don't know. And some of you, you don't know, but you just said something because it looks good on the screen. But you don't even know. But I'm just telling you, don't feel the pressure of somebody pushing you into something to do. But just look down deep on the inside of you. I'm saying this to these students. I'm saying this to those that are drawing Social Security. And just begin to dream again. I, this is a series. i got to remember that because I preached one-tenth of my message. But even if you're up in age, one day I was visiting my brother. My brother was in prison right above, some of you know his testimony, but he was in Cor up above Corbin, Kentucky in prison, Manchester. I was coming back from visiting him one day, my son and I, and every time I would drive through, I'd see this billboard, and it would say, the original Kentucky Fried Chicken. Well, being a preacher, I felt like that's something I needed to do in my life, was go see the original Kentucky Fried Chicken. So I go over there, and I really, I really, I knew Colonel Sanders. I remember growing up as a kid, I'd see the real Colonel Sanders do the TV commercials. And... So I knew about Colonel Sanders a little bit, but when I went to that place, it was like a museum. And I walked through it, and it told the whole story about Harlan Sanders. Harlan Sanders had built, I'm going to tell this and I'm done. Harlan Sanders had built this little roadside gas station on the state highway that ran through Corbin, Kentucky in the 50s. And he'd built a good business there. People would stop on that highway as they were passing through, and they would stop and they would get gas. And then he did so well that he built a hotel, like a little roadside lodge. And people would stop and spend the night there. And then that got doing so well, his wife started cooking biscuits there at the gas station. And people from the, the hotel, the motel, would come over and, and eat her chicken and biscuits and all that. But then the interstate system started coming through in the 60s. And Interstate 75 came right through Corbin, Kentucky, and it took all the traffic away from that state highway where he was at. He was 65 years old. He'd done pretty well, but he lost everything that he had. Filed bankruptcy. Lost it all. 65 years old. Everything he'd worked for his whole life was gone. And he said, what can I do? I'm 65, and he gets his first Social Security check. If I recall, it was $120. And he got that first Social Security check of $120. He said, one thing I know how to do is fry chicken. So he got his special recipe and he stuck it in the back of his truck along with some chicken in a cooler. And he started going from place to place and he would fry up chicken in the back of his car and he would sell people the recipe. At 65 years old, a bankrupt 65 year old man with nothing but a $120 social security check started doing what he had a dream to do. And at 65 years old, and then at 70 years old, he went to Bob Rogers Church in Kentucky, in Louisville, Kentucky, walked in and gave his life to Jesus. Did you know that, that, that Colonel Sanders was a tongue-talking, spirit-filled, Holy Ghost chicken cooker? You can go to Louisville, Kentucky, and go to the prayer, I forget what they call that church now, but it's Bob Rogers is the pastor there. You can go to this beautiful church that runs thousands of people, built by Colonel Sanders. And he became the wealthiest franchisee in history. But at 65, he was bankrupt. So whether you're a student graduating high school or you're somebody 
that's sitting here this morning and you're up in age and it looks like your greatest years are behind you? No. God has a plan for your life. It's good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. I want you to stand with me, please, all over this room. And I want to ask you to do something with me. I did this in the first service. If you'll look in front of your seat, if you'll stay with me for just a moment, I know it's late and I know you want to slip out. If you'll stay with me for just a moment, I'm not going to keep you long. Look in front of your seat. You see these cards? Listen, you don't even have to. I want everybody to get one of these. You don't have to fill out your name. I'm not asking for that. This is not about us. It's not about me. It's about you. I'm just doing this because it's in front of you and it's simple. I, I didn't plan to do this this morning, but since I did it in the early service, I want to do it in this service. Down at the bottom, it has prayer requests. I want you to forget about that for just a moment. And I want you to consider this right here. Where are you at right now in your walk with God and your life? What is it you're trusting God for? What are you dreaming for? I want you, if you need a pen, these ushers can help you with it. But right where that prayer request is at, I want you, before you leave this place this morning, would you just write down, you don't have to put your name, nobody has to know it's you. I just want you to do something for me. This is what the Lord spoke to me to do this morning. And I wrote it down myself. After church, I went and found one of these and I wrote my dream on it. And I stuck it on this altar. And that's what I want to ask you to do. I want you to write down, if, if money was no object, if nothing was an object, a hindrance, an obstacle. Because the reality is, I remember a missionary speaking at a pastor's conference one time, and he asked this question to everybody that was in attendance. He said, if finances was no object, what would you do for the Lord? And I began to think about it. I thought, well, if, if that was no object, I, I, I started making a whole list of things I would do. I knew exactly what I would do. I, I, would build a, I would build a rehab center and pay for it, and I would do it in a way that it would just be done excellence. That's what I, I, I wrote that down. I wrote down that I would make sure there was no hungry people in my city. Nobody went to bed hungry at night. And I wrote that down, along with some other things. And then he came back. As a matter of fact, it was Jonathan Sawyer's pastor that said this. And he said, he followed that up, and he said, you serve a God that has the resources of heaven. And money and finances are not an object. Whatever you're dreaming for God to do, there's no obstacles. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or imagine. I want you to write your dream down on that card. Would you do that? Whatever it is you're trusting God for. Maybe it's, you say, well, pastor, it's not spiritual. Whatever it is, whatever it is, it, it may be, I, I would just, I, I just wish God would give us a, another house. God's not upset about that. If he wants you to have it, dream about it. If it's his will, you'll have it. Whatever it is, would you write it down on there? Or maybe even if you don't have a pen, because this is all just before the Lord. Even if you don't have a pen, just, just, just put your dream visually on that card. But here's what I want us to do. I, this has nothing to do with us. It's about you. It's about just taking a step of faith. But I want you to do what I did. If you've written it down or if you write it down in your heart, but still come and just lay it on the altar. Would you do that this morning all over this room? Would you do that? Just bring your dreams to this altar and just stand. Once you get here, just stand with me and we'll dismiss from the altar. Just lay it before the Lord and say, God, this is my dream and I put it in your hands. You can use me. Hallelujah. If you can use anything Lord, you can use me. just a moment for everybody to get, get their card on the altar. We're going to pray and we'll dismiss from the altar. Sing it again. Can you sing that? If you can use anything Lord, you can use me. Come on, say it again. If you can use anything Lord, if you can use anything Lord, Hey.
Make my hands walk and my feet touch my heart. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. You can use anything, Lord. You can use me. I want us to pray. Listen. Whatever it is that you're dreaming for from the Lord, here's what I challenge you. If you had to stand before judgment, before a judge, and give an account, would you be able to say, I was not disobedient to that heavenly call? Because whatever it is you're dreaming about, God wants you to do all you can do, and then he steps in and does what you can't do. If we do everything we can, God says, I'll step up and do what you can't. That's where faith and miracle and supernatural, we do the natural, he does the supernatural. You can't just lay it on the altar and say, okay, okay, God, you do this. You have to make a way. You have to open the doors. When God opens the door, you got to walk through the door. When God closes the door, you got to say, okay, God, I'll go this way. So we got to do our part. And I want to challenge you. I don't want you to take this and just run with it and think, okay, this is all God. Because it takes our investment. It takes our responsibility. But here, here's what I believe. And again, I, I've got three weeks to preach this series out. And I'll share more and more and more of why I believe this with my whole heart. I said this morning in the early service, what I'm preaching to you is not something that a second cousin had a friend that knew somebody that knew this stuff. I've lived this. I know it's true. I know that God is faithful. I'm standing here today, right now. Right now, I've got, I've got two children in their 20s who will have heart surgery this year. It doesn't even make sense. I don't understand that, but I can tell you that God has been so faithful. Just a few days ago, the doctors, Austin sends me the reports that the doctor did all the checkups, all the tests, and they said, you look like you were born with this heart valve. Go and live to be 100 years old. <laughs> Praise God. So I said, son, don't stop dreaming because I remember when he was, when my twins, and he's one of them, when they were born, the doctor said their, their organs are not going to fully develop. They won't have, their heart won't develop, their brain won't develop, they won't be able to function. He said, there's no hope. And I looked at the doctor and I said, doctor, I'll let you deal with the medicine and I'll deal with the hope. And I went into that that area where my son was at and I reached into that incubator where he was covered up with wires and monitors and they said you can't touch him you, you, you can't do that there's a risk for infection I said you're telling me there's no hope and you're telling me I can't touch my baby but I've got a vial of oil right here and I believe in the power of prayer and I'm gonna lay hands on my baby and I'm gonna believe that God's gonna raise him up And they said he wouldn't leave that hospital but three days later they were preparing him for discharge because God healed him and touched him So he grew up with no problems, no health problems, played baseball, football, golf, basketball, everything he could play and did everything with no problems. So when the doctors came and I sat in that surgeon's office back in January of this year and the doctor said, here's your option, A or B. Other than that, there's no hope. I said, oh, you didn't just say that. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, watch this. And y'all know, y'all know. I don't even have to tell you. I don't even talk about that. And the next day, the next day, God sends a miraculous breakthrough. First person in the United States to get heart valve. And God said, I may not, he's going to have to have surgery, but I'm going to perform such a supernatural, watch this moment, that I'm going to do something that's going to be such a testimony of my grace and my mercy that it'll be told around the world. And I, that's, just my, that's just one of my stories, but I'm telling you, when it looks like you're at the end of the road, like your dream is over, like the, you, you, you can't imagine what would be any different than where you're at right now, God will turn that thing around for his glory, and he will make Make dreams come true amen these dreams are coming true without a vision the people perish let me tell you what all this right here on this altar represents I'm gonna leave these up here guys just leave them up here because over the next few weeks I want these to lay on the altar because what this tells me is this is a church with a vision come on y'all help me 
Because where there is no vision, the people perish. But laying on these altars this morning, there's some vision, there's some dreams. And where there's dreams and where there's vision, there is a church that is alive and that will thrive with the glory of God. And so right now, I'm going to dismiss you with this prayer. But we're going to pray over these and we're going to believe that today, this week, this month, in the next 30 days, the next 90 days, we're going to believe that some dreams are coming true. And when they begin to unfold, you better testify of what God's done. You come and say, Pastor, i got to tell you what I put on that card, and I'm going to tell you what God's doing. Because we are made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we need to celebrate in this house what God is getting ready to do. On my dream right there, it is that every, I know this, is, this sounds crazy, but I pray every lost person in Mobile County gets saved. Say, Pastor, that's impossible. Oh, no, it's not. It happened at Nineveh. It can happen in Mobile. I pray, God, that there'll be no more drug addiction in Mobile. I'm dreaming for a day when every service we can pack in here to we, i got to find somewhere else to even put a building because this building can't contain them in two services, three services. I believe God is about to do something significant in this city. I pray that he'll use us to do it. Father, I pray right now for every card that's in this room, on this altar that represents vision and dreams. Lord, you know the hearts of those that are in this place. You know the dreams you've given them to us. Many of them have been deposited into our spirits through you. Oh God, I dream for some big things. God, even as I stand up here on this stage and I look over this sanctuary, my dreams are not small, they're big, they're a big thing. There's some dreams represented in this sanctuary. They're not small, they're, they're, they're not human dreams, they're divine dreams. It's dreams that's going to take the supernatural hand of God to make come to pass. But God, I declare in the name of Jesus that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask, think, imagine, or dream. And right now, God, I pray for breakthrough like this church has never seen, like these people have never seen, like this world has never seen. God, begin to move the mountains, begin to move the strongholds that are in the way. And I declare in Jesus' name that dreams are coming true, that we will not be disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Bring it to pass, God, and we're going to give you the glory and the honor for all that you do for you are worthy of our praise in Jesus name we pray and if you believe it shout amen amen, amen. can you give God praise that dreams are coming true in Jesus name God bless you I love you we'll see you Wednesday night